All right, guys, so EIP7702 is shipping with Spectra, which is right around the corner. And I don't feel my timeline is excited enough about this right now. So in order to get you guys excited, I will break down what EIP7702 is on a high level and what it enables. But most importantly, we'll be looking at a EVM implementation and look at every line of code that changes due to that EIP. I think the best way to truly understand it is by looking at the code changes in the EVM. Yeah, we'll be looking at the at Reven, which is a Rust implementation of the EVM, mainly because it has EIP 7702 already implemented and it's a super cool and flexible EVM framework. And it's being used by loads of projects downstream like RES, uh, Foundry and and many more. So EIP 7702 is about account obstruction. And first of you might wonder why do we have another EIP about account obstruction? Because you might be familiar with EIP 4337, which brought account obstruction to Ethereum. I want to treat about this sometime. EIP 4337 is not an actual change to the EVM and doesn't bring native account obstruction to Ethereum, but instead it's a standard on which people agreed. And it brought an interface to a smart contract wallet that would be used by many tools and apps um, in the ecosystem in order to offer the benefits that come with uh, programmable wallets. There were, however, some problems with it. Uh, first of all, it's a separate account. So people would have to migrate from the EOA to the actual smart contract wallet which was suboptimal and reduced uh, the adoption people had hoped for. And second, it relied on off-chain infrastructure because the user flow would work like this. A user would send a signed user operation to some off-chain mempool. Then a bundler would take those user operations, send them to an entry uh, point smart contract, which would then forward them to your specific wallet. Now contrast this with EIP 7702, which brings a smart contract functionality right to your EOA. And that doesn't require any kind of migration and leaving your existing wallet as it is. All it does it is, re is that it requires a signature from you to upgrade your EOA to offer certain programmable functionality. Thereafter, your existing EOA offers all the benefits that come with a smart account, such as gas sponsorship, uh, transaction batching, and much more. So how does EIP7702 make all of this possible? The title of this EIP kind of sums it up by saying it adds a new transaction type that permanently sets the code for an EOA. So what is the code for an EOA? In Ethereum, you have two types of accounts. You have externally owned accounts, EOAs, and contract accounts. EOAs are those that have a public-private key pair that can initiate transactions. And contract accounts are those that cannot initiate transactions but have smart contract functionality. In any case, both of these account types have a state with these four fields, a nonce, a balance, a storage hash, and a code hash. Now, historically speaking, the code hash for EOAs was a hash of an empty string, as in EOAs, externally owned accounts, could not hold any smart contract bytecode. On the other hand, for smart contracts, this code hash is populated in that it is the hash of the bytecode of the smart contract. And the code hash points to the runtime bytecode. This changes now with EIP 7702 in that um, not only contract accounts, but also uh, externally owned accounts can have a code hash of a non-empty bytecode. And that bytecode takes a very specific format and it's being referred to as the delegation designator and looks like this. So externally owned accounts can hold bytecode formatted in the following way in order to be identified as a smart account. And let's look at what this delegation designator is composed of. So it's, it has a prefix first, which is this two byte prefix, which I think acts as some kind of namespace and then followed by zero zero, which is the version number. And then um, those three bytes gets uh, concatenated with the address. And the address is the smart contract address of the uh, smart contract wallet whose functionality this externally owned account wants to leverage. So here you can already see that the actual runtime bytecode of the smart contract wallet functionality does not sit on the externally owned account state 
but instead it has a pointer to that functionality, which is this address. So once an EOA was upgraded, this delegation designator will be in its state under the code field. And any call to that EOA will now be redirected to this address. Now, important to note here is that when this call gets redirected to the smart contract wallet, we stay in the context of the externally owned account state. So this redirection works similarly to a delegate call. Yeah, you will see when we look at the EVM, EVM implementation that the only thing that gets swapped out of the account is the bytecode. But for example, the balance and all other account uh, state related stuff stays as the one from the externally owned account. So to sum this up, once externally owned account has this delegation designator in its state under the code field, it is an upgraded account that benefits from the smart contract functionality of this set address here. But now let's have a look at how this externally owned account can be upgraded to a smart account by setting this delegation designator in the first place. In order to actually upgrade externally owned account to a, a smart account, a EIP 7702 introduces a new type of transaction, which includes the so-called authorization list. And the authorization list is a list composed of many different authorization from externally owned account owners. If such a transaction is received uh, within the pre-execution phase of the EVM, we loop through every authorization in that list and verify that the authorization is valid. So let's have a look at what an authorization looks like. It uh, contains the chain ID. It contains the address to which an externally owned account owner wants to delegate his functionality to, then a nonce and a signature by the externally owned account owner. Now, if the signature is valid, we move on to check the account's code. If this account code is empty, it shows that it's an externally owned account that has not been upgraded yet. Then we move on to write the delegation code, which is, as we looked at earlier, is this prefix with the delegated address where the delegated address is taken from the authorization itself. Also, if it has already been delegated in the past and that field, the code field is not empty, then uh, we just update it to the new delegated address that is included in that authorization this time. However, if that account has some other bytecode, it means it's a smart contract and we move on to the next authorization list and don't do anything here. So I hope this was helpful to kind of summarize the inner workings of EIP 7702. But I think to really understand it, we need to dive into the code. So let's do that next.